Hi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. And a very warm welcome to this uh, conference in honour of um, Professor Alan Kerman. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, face to face for a change. So thank you very much indeed, everybody who's uh, battled through various transportation issues. My name is Angus Armstrong. I'm the director of Rebuilding Macroeconomics, which I'm delighted to say is now uh, part of the uh, Institute for Global Prosperity at UCL. And um, I have to read out some housekeeping rules. There are nine of them, so um, if you bear with me, I'll try and make them short. First, uh, no food or drink is allowed in the auditorium, except for water on the top table, <laughs> which is a bit unfair, but there we are. Um, there is plenty of water outside. Uh, people aren't allowed to walk around uh, other than go to the uh, bathrooms, which are sort of out of these doors left and then right. If you walk around beyond that or want to leave, you have to speak to Stephanie, who's outside at the uh, main uh, desk. No photos other than people speaking or the slides in the auditorium, but not outside of the auditorium. There's no planned fire alarms and the Wi-Fi code is on the top table, which I'll move it along because it's a bit tricky to see um, later. And the badges have to be worn or you have to wear a, a guest um, lanyard from the Bank of England. And final two, first of all, the doors to the um, auditorium close at 6.30 both evenings. so then you can't get out, so probably better to leave. Um, and finally, uh, if you have a question, we have some microphones, I hope. And you have to speak in the microphones because it's all going to be recorded for our uh, Rebuilding Macro YouTube channel. So please do ask questions in the microphone, otherwise it won't get picked up. So that's all of the housekeeping rules. So to formally uh, open uh, this conference in honour of Alan, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Henry Moore, to, to open proceedings. Henry, sir. Very much, Angus. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Professor Henrietta Moore, as Angus has said, and I'm the founder and director of the Institute of, for Global Prosperity at University College London. And I'm very delighted to welcome you all here to the Bank of England, as well as those of you who are joining us online to celebrate the research and career, and career of Alan Kerman. I'd like to start, of course, by thanking our hosts at the Bank of England, Rebuilding Macroeconomics for organising this event, and most importantly, Professor Alan Kerman and all the speakers and chairs for taking the time to join this Feshrift event in Alan's honour. Now, Alan has changed conventional wisdom and argued boldly and persuasively for new ways of thinking about prosperity and the economics that can deliver it. This is important for the Institute for Global Prosperity, which I direct we work across Europe, Asia, Africa and the Middle East to redesign prosperity for the 21st century. This includes changing the way we conceive and run our economies to deliver quality of life, secure livelihoods and economic and social well-being for people and the planet. Alan's work is an important guiding light for us at the IGP. He's made impressive contributions to economic theory and practice with several classic papers with which many of you in this room will be familiar. And those include whom or what does the representative individual represent, fairness and envy, and the critical but very important paper on the intrinsic limits of modern economic theory, the emperor has no clothes. He's also succeeded in publishing a paper about the behavior of ants in a leading economics journal. And this might appear far removed from the economy or indeed prosperity, but it is core to Alan's contribution. In order to understand the relationship between individual behaviour and aggregate patterns, in other words, the relationship between society and the macroeconomy, the interactions between human agents must be front and centre of the analysis. Social interaction is the basis of our life together. Methodological individualism and the rational representative agent, as Alan has argued, cannot therefore be the foundations for an economics concerned with explaining how humans run and react to the economy. Economic models should be reasonable approximations of the empirical economy, and part of the problem here is aggregation. The work that I do as part of redefining prosperity for the 21st century argues against macroeconomic measures of prosperity and well-being that assume the summation of individual well-being is what forms our collective well-being. 
There are complicated issues here about the relationship between the micro and the macro, and a clear sense that we need to return to localism, to complex interactions in context, to something we might term the meso. Clearly, prosperity and well-being are the result of a set of intersecting and interconnecting factors that must be more than an aggregate of individual well-being. Well-being is too often characterised nowadays as a set of attributes pertaining to the individual, rather than a set, rather than a series of effects produced in specific times and places through the relationships established by living well together in functioning social, economic and political systems and ecosystems. Today and tomorrow, we will explore what a range of scientific and other disciplines can add to economics. In fields such as statistical physics, ecology and social psychology, it is now widely accepted that systems of interacting agents will not have the sort of behaviour that corresponds to that of one average or typical particle or individual. However, perhaps this has not yet had much impact, impact on economics, and this is a subject you will all discuss. While the disciplines I've mentioned have advanced to study the emergence of outcomes, economics continues to work from the premise of an equilibrium and then asks what behaviour is consistent with this outcome. We need to move on from standard economic models. In Alan's own words, it is clear that the representative agent deserves a decent burial as an approach to economic analysis that is not only primitive, but fundamentally erroneous. Alan has long argued for progressing beyond the dominant paradigm of modern economic theory, which he suggests is neither validated by empirical evidence nor based on sound theoretical foundations. As we know, last week's failure of the Silicon Valley Bank and yesterday the crisis at Credit Suisse have heightened concerns about the stability of the financial system, demonstrating the fragility of our economic systems and propensity for non-equilibrium outcomes. We have this idea that we have a system which is in equilibrium and that every now and then it gets knocked off equilibrium by a shock. But these shocks are, of course, part of the system. We are, in fact, out of equilibrium most of the time. The work we are doing at Rebuilding Macroeconomics, which, as Angus said, is part of the IGP and is led by Angus, builds on Alan's insights by placing human interaction at the centre of its analysis and investigating how such interaction responds to uncertainty. The core idea of rebuilding macroeconomics is to embrace uncertainty. If orthodox economics can be described as the science of choice in well-defined situations, then rebuilding macroeconomics looks at choice in ill-defined situations. While uncertainty implies that we must go through life in partial ignorance, it also creates spaces for us to imagine and to grow our knowledge. Our desire to make sense of the world requires that we go beyond our own curiosity in isolation to build networks of connections with other people. This is not acquisitional, but rather relational and performative. This is a view of the economy as self-organising, but not necessarily self-stabilising. An economy that emerges from the direct interactions between millions of people as they seek to discover better frameworks to make sense of their changing world. It shifts the emphasis from aggregation and fixed points to processes of knowledge creation and sustainability. It allows us to return to the time honoured big macroeconomic questions of wealth creation, distribution, coordination, institutions and public policy. The influence of Alan in this agenda is clear. Today and tomorrow, we will explore important elements of a new paradigm. This includes themes such as heterogeneity and aggregation, interaction and emergence, cooperative and non-cooperative behaviour, equilibrium and non-equilibrium solutions, and perhaps most important of all, the application of economic theory to policy. Now, many academics would be content to limit their influence to that of economic science. But Alan has made an immense contribution in trying to affect what we might call the economic engineering. He was the chief advisor to the New Approaches to Economic Challenges initiative at the OECD and has worked tirelessly to try to put new economic ideas onto the policy table to help the economic engineers. Alan characterised the economic crisis of 2008 as a crisis for economic theory 
And whether or not we have escaped the effects of the first, we are fully within the embrace of the second. We may be lo locked into the wrong system, but that doesn't mean that changing a paradigm is easy. Whether there are Keynesians among you in this room or not, Keynes had it about right when he said that the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping old ones. Let me close by congratulating Alan once again. Thank you for everything you have done to enrich the academic and policy debate. The enthusiasm of such an excellent group of academics who join us today is testament to your legacy as a distinguished academic and theorist, an inspiration and a good friend and colleague to many in the room. So thank you all for coming to the conference. Welcome again. I'm going to hand back to Angus now, who is going to introduce William Hines, who will chair the first panel on Alan's intellectual journey. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Henrietta. Uh, our first session is titled Alan's Intellectual Journey and will be chaired by a very good friend of mine, William Hines. William is known to many of you. He um, leads the New Approaches to Economic Challenges initiative at the OECD, which has been remarkably successful over the last, uh, I think it's six years, in bringing together people who want to look at alternative ways of uh, understanding economic systems. William will be joined by Lucrezia Reichlin and um, Bob Axtell, and uh, Jim Heckman will be uh, coming in uh, by video. So, William, over to you. Hey, uh, well, good afternoon. Um, so, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We have about 60 years to uh, get through in the next uh, hour, Alan Kerman's intellectual journey. And the objective of this session is really to lay out some context to understand the environments in which uh, Alan has been uh, learning and teaching, and the colleagues he's worked with, and true interaction and cooperation, how the different strands of his thinking emerged. And we'll hear from colleagues who've worked on the different stages in his uh, career. His journey begins in Jesus College, Oxford in the late 1950s, where he was an undergraduate. Uh, after that, he became a geography teacher and he was schoolmaster at Bedford Modern School in uh, Bedford in the early 60s. He uh, left teaching to join the master's program at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna. And uh, his first academic article was published there with uh, one of the faculty there, Wilson Schmidt, uh, and he published on key currency burdens. And of course, Wilson Schmidt was the father of Eric Schmidt, who became the CEO of Google. And uh, Eric Schmidt has said that his time in Italy was very influential. Um, but he did ask the question of his father at the time, if you're such a good economist, uh, why are we not rich? Um, so uh, Alan started there. He pursued his PhD in economics initially in Minnesota, uh, where he he found it very cold and very mathematical. And uh, one of his big influences, Hugo Sonnenschein, uh, encouraged him to learn math, but also learn some economics in an economics PhD. So uh, he encouraged him to move to Princeton. And uh, in 1966, he went there to pursue his PhD. He joined a class of 12, of which, uh, in Alan's word, many did OK. Uh, among their ranks included future editors of the American Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Literature, uh, while other economics departments emphasized competition among students. Uh, at Princeton, they really encouraged cooperation and perhaps the the most famous classmate of 12 was James Heckman, uh, who is willing to kick off our, our reflection here. I hope he's he's able to join us now. Uh, he, professor Heckman is, of course, Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor in Economics, uh, and he's been at Chicago since 1973. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000 and the John Bates Clark Medal in 1983. So, uh, Professor Heckman. Oh, OK. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. I, I had this mute on for a minute. 
Okay, well, it's my pleasure to speak briefly about the early years. I guess I'm uh, I'm part of the uh, I'm part of the origin story here for Alan Kerman, and so I will. Professor, sorry. Um, I wonder if you could adjust your camera. We're just seeing the top of your head, so there we go. Ah, perfect. Ah, but now we made it. <laughs> You're sorry, it's Professor. Asking you to unmute again. Is yeah. that okay now? That's okay. Okay, good. So it's it's really my pleasure to talk about Alan. And uh, as was stated, we were graduate students together at Princeton University in 1966. We started and we shared a lot of a common inspiration. And I would also remind him of some of the misery <laughs> that we shared. Um, it wasn't highly competitive. It was a very small group. Uh, and I think it was probably more like a study group or a small college in, in England or Oxford, for example or maybe a liberal arts college. We had a lot of a lot of stimulating discussions and some very strange lectures and some very informative lectures as well. So in those early days when Alan just arrived, uh, he was uh, uh, an inspiration in some sense. He had come back from, uh, uh, he'd come from Minnesota where he had been influenced, I think, partially by John Chipman, the late John Chipman, I should say, and I guess also Hugo Sonnenschein and he was working uh, in the mathematical economics, but also in general economics. And in his early days and cl classes that we took together, there were a lot. Princeton didn't have requirements in the usual sense. At the time, it was very unscripted. We, you could really go through the program without any, uh, without any, any particular requirement or taking any course for a grade. There were general exams required at the end of two years but you could do whatever you wanted to do. Uh, in fact, a good friend of mine who is in mathematics uh, became very interested in stamps and built a stamp business in his first two years at uh, Princeton in the math department. Uh, he did leave the math department, I should say, but he's very wealthy in selling stamps. It gave us a great deal of freedom. But some of the classes that we talked about, I think give you an idea of what, uh, what uh, Alan was exposed to. We had the two particular people who were somewhat unusual, but gave us a perspective that I think many people didn't get a chance to see in, in their training. One of our professors was Fritz Machler. He was an old Austrian professor. He was born in 1902. Uh, he was uh, uh, an, a true Austrian in the sense of born in Vienna, educated at the University of Vienna, and had been on the faculty of the University of Vienna until some anti-Semitic uh, episodes in the early 30s, long before the Nazis came in, drove him out and brought him to the United States. He ended up at Princeton and he taught us something that I think is probably still valuable for Alan, it's valuable for me. He was trained, he being Machlup, was trained in looking at capital theory, Austrian capital theory, and for that matter, other kinds of capital theory, Frank Knight's theory. These are models that aren't much taught anymore. But it was extremely useful. And I noticed among a few people on this planet, I'm one of those, and I think Alan's another, who suffered through Hayek's pure theory of capital, folding out maps and looking at the, the notion of uh, tomahawks and uh, arrows being folded into the uh, industrial base of modern countries. But quite seriously, the Matlab provided a perspective which was quite unusual. Now, he was a man from another era. I mean, he was a person, I don't think he knew much mathematics. He wasn't able to essentially write things out in any formal way. And he would bring a compass and protractor to the to class and draw these graphs on the board. It was quite colorful in, in some ways, but it was also quite informative. And I felt I learned a great deal about Austrian economics, capital theory, and the points of view that were still being debated at that time in the 1960s. Joan Robinson was very active. Solo and Samuelson and Passanetti on the reswitching controversy. So there was a lot of discussion, and this was background, which has turned out to be very useful. And Alan was a lively participant in that discussion. I think Fritz Macklop actually liked Alan very much. Maybe it was the English accent, maybe it was familiarity with Europe, I'm not sure. But it was a stimulating class, and, and Alan contributed a great deal to that class. There was another class talking about general equilibrium where Alan uh, and I suffered for sure. We went through a class by a person named Robert Keeney. Keeney was a man who wrote a very, a big book, let's put it that way, 
large book. I'm not sure it was an influential book on general equilibrium theory. This is Walrasian models. And uh, what I remember most is suffering with Alan at 8 a.m. We'd walk into a classroom where Keeney had written his lecture out one hour before. So we walked into this classroom and we saw board after board covered with equations. And for note taking students, it was essentially impossible. So we more or less gave up. I, I can't remember much about that class other than I was glad it was over. And I think Alan suffered in the same way. But we also had a lot of very stimulating discussions and Alan was uh, was very useful. And so, you know, I felt very strongly <clears throat> that Alan was, uh, you know, a strong member of the class and an active participant. And he would also <clears throat> uh, challenge us in a way that I think was a little bit unusual for Princeton at the time. There was a lot of active discussion one on one, but not a lot of sharp exchange. And uh, I think Alan helped sharpen the exchange and improve the quality of the environment a lot. So that was kind of my experience with Alan. I think uh, he and I took different paths. We took a lot of courses together. This was in mathematical economics. Harold Kuhn was very strong. Uh, and then A.W. Tucker uh, of the Kuhn-Tucker theorem was also very strong. And we had earlier uh, work done or people who are working in mathematical economics, but from another era. People like Oscar Morgenstern, who it would talk about his experiences with von Neumann, but really wasn't very analytical at that stage. And he was getting somewhat up in years anyway, so it wasn't a sharp thing, but it was an interesting small group. And we were able to learn a lot of different topics because the program was small and because we could talk with each other and we could learn about each other's work. I think it was a valuable experience. And, and Alan was there and playing a very, very uh, useful role in that ray. I would say now my, my next exposure, my next career with Alan, it was a long hiatus. He did a lot of important work, as I'm sure you're going to hear about, in game theory and in early general equilibrium theory. He was doing a lot of work with Hild Werner Hildenbrand and the group of theorists at Bonn. And he uh, did work, then I read the work. Uh, he sent it to me, uh, such as it was, you know, this is the mail back in the 1970s or so. But I, I was following his work and I felt I learned a great deal from that work, even though I myself took a path more towards labor economics. But then when I read his work, emerging work on complexity, uh, this, re, this, in, this brought Alan back into my life. So the work on complexity and on uh, criticism of some of the naive models of economic theory, especially macroeconomic theory, resonated with me. I've, I, of course, have been in Chicago for many years. I was present uh, as the rational expectations, quote, revolution, uh, both was unveiled and was then uh, uh, collapsed or at least retreated from considerably. And uh, Alan was a, uh, Alan's challenge to some of the standard lines about representative agent models and about many of these models that dominated macroeconomics at the time were very useful for me as in a person surrounded in an environment where the representative agent was the way of the world and there was no, no understanding. I'm a microeconomist. I've always been interested in agent heterogeneity and exploring the implications of that, but at some cost with my macro colleagues. And so Alan's work was stimulating to me and I thought very important. But I will say, as Alan himself admitted, that in the Minnesota and in the uh, Chicago environments and in the satellite schools, it hasn't had much of an impact because they simply cling to the old points of view. And I think that's not just unique to Chicago or Minnesota. I remember having a discussion with Blanchard when we were visiting some school together in Spain, Simphi, as a matter of fact, and he was telling us about macro. We needed to teach macro. So I asked him, well, why are you still teaching Aero de Bru as part of macro? Well, because, you know, we can look at deviations from it, but it still presents the core idea. So that's why I, I always had my deep suspicions, but I retreated into my own world, which is empirical. And I was working on models that did allow for heterogeneity. And because I was somewhat of an outsider to that group, I, I preserved my own work, did my own work and tried a lot of things. Okay. So Alan was interesting to read and important for me to read because I realized there was a there was a larger world out there and discussing these very concerns that I believed were important. 
But then recently his work on the new approaches to economic uh, challenges, uh, I got brought back into that as a participant. And a uh, participant, I've been doing a lot of work on understanding uh, uh, what some people would call behavioral economics. I would call preferences, understanding the structure of decision making of agents, and then understanding how human beings are created. In other words, how skills are created, how we can essentially influence their environments. And so I participated in some seminars, both through the uh, new approaches format and also through an INET seminar that we had in Paris a few years ago. And Alan, again, played a very useful role in essentially bringing people together and recognizing that this notion of agent heterogeneity and the agents, uh, the way that agents interacted played a fundamental role. And uh, I was very pleased to participate in that. And I recognize Alan's great contributions in this area. He probably is unaware that I read his work as much as I do, but it, it's partly a matter that started back in the Princeton days when I knew that he had plenty to say and I followed his work. His thesis was quite interesting on trade and ever since I followed it. But this new line of work, really trying to understand the complexity of the economy and understanding the nature of how agents interact and departing from some of this, I would say, quasi-religion. I mean, the one part of rational expectations as an empiricist that always bothered me is that it had no empirical content because there was no rule for deciding what rational agents would actually use for their information. And this is the kind of criticism that, that, uh, that Alan made and uh, in, in a way that is, is very useful. I think moving forward, we need to think more specifically about using these models in precise context about how to, how to allow for more specifically for empirical relationships, predictions out of these models about, uh, about how agents interact. So I wanna congratulate Alan on a successful life. I hope it continues. Uh, he certainly influenced me. I know he's influenced others. Uh, Chicago is not a monolith. We had people like Buzz Brock and many other people here who were descent, and for that matter, Hugo Sonenschein, the aforementioned Hugo Sonenschein was president and then faculty member here. So there were and are dissenting points of view, but Alan has provided, has enriched the academic atmosphere and he's enriched the policy environment by bringing these issues to the fore. So I commend him on that and congratulate him on the event. And I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, we're about to start a quarter here, and so I, I really couldn't travel. But it's fantastically uh, a great opportunity for me to at least express to Alan my sincere appreciation for his work and to recognition that he has had a big impact on me and on many others that I know thinking about the way the economy actually operates. So thank you. Thanks so much, Thanks so Professor. Much. As, as for your point on quality, thanks. As for your point on religion, uh, all I can say is amen. Um, so, Professor uh, Harold Kuhn, as you mentioned, was a major influence on Alan, his PhD supervisor. And he sought out Kuhn because Kuhn was very good at explaining things and uh, he wanted to get away from from math, a great teacher. And um, as uh, Professor Heckman mentioned, he finished his uh, PhD on optimum tariffs in a general equilibrium model of trade. Um, his work uh, then focused on economic theory in his early years and was perhaps quite conventional. He wrote papers like A New Approach to the Uniqueness of Equilibrium. He, uh, he met uh, Werner Wildebrand, Wildenbrandt on a, a beach in Santa Monica, and they worked together in Belgium on uh, general equilibrium, which uh, Alan said that even at the time he was quite skeptical about, but he, he wrote a lot about it. And uh, I asked him what his sort of overarching approach to research was, and he, he said that uh, basically he looks at what's going on, uh, which seems a pretty reasonable way of going about things. So he's looked at how markets have worked. He's done some a lot of practical work on this. Uh, for example, in 1970, he did a report for the U.S. Department of Commerce on uh, the marine insurance industry. Um, he has moved around quite a lot. Uh, he was in 
in Belgium. He moved to Warwick in the mid 70s and uh, then went to um, the south of France and uh, decided that he didn't want to go back to Coventry. I don't know why that might have been. Um, he also claims that he was the first non French professor in an economics department, which I'm somewhat skeptical about, but I think that's right. And then he moved to the university, uh, European University Institute in Florence. Uh, but in the late 80s, you see new perspectives emerging in his work. Uh, for example, in 1989, the intrinsic limits of economic theory, the emperor is no close in the economic journal. And in 1990, he wrote a paper with Lucrezia Rechling, our second speaker, uh, taking a critical perspective on the economic lessons of uh, the Marshall Plan. And uh, Lucrezia is professor of economics at the London Business School, and she's uh, received PhD in economics from NYU. And um, she's also published numerous papers on econometrics, macroeconomics forecasting, and is uh, an expert on nowcasting as well. So Lucrezia. Thank you. And uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, and uh, Alan is a very special friend, a, a person who had uh, an enormous influence in my personal and professional life. Although somehow I managed to escape his grip, so, uh, but I survived. And but I'm still very grateful for that part of the journey that uh, we did together. So I've been asked to, uh, to recollect, you know, his professional life, but I think a lot of you have done it already. Uh, I met Alan uh, uh, at Florence in the 80s um, and, uh, you know, I, I turned out to become a time serious economist and then a central banker, so I had a quite a different uh, career path. But uh, as I said, OK, so my conversation and uh, also some of the work we did together was very influential. I want to uh, just say something about uh, the beginning uh, and, uh, you know, basically tell you what I think it means to, to be a contrarian, okay, and to, to be in this profession as a contrarian, and the way in which Alan has decided to be a contrarian. So, you know, Alan started uh, in general equilibrium, and uh, as uh, you have uh, recalled, um, and then his journey was uh, a journey away from that framework. And I think that as in religion, only people who once believe can understand the roots of those beliefs and uh, you know why abandoning that uh, it means you know to radical rethinking foundations so his journey has been an effort to you know establish new foundation so Alan work has been both a search for alternative ways of explaining empirical facts for example by setting behavior or general economic dynamics and an attempt to rebuild the discipline uh, from new foundation. So his message has not just been, um, you know, here's the evidence that agents interact rather than behaving in an atomistic uh, way. It has been more ambitious. Since they do, there must be fundamentally different ways of modeling the world than one in which, which is based on individual optimization. So we do not want uh, uh, to model deviations from optimization, friction, as macroeconomists call it, uh, from that benchmark, but rebuild. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, I think that, uh, you know, this journey was really uh, started uh, uh, because of his encounter with Hugo Sonnenschein, his first advisor in Minnesota. I remember Alan talking to me about it uh, and, um, and, you know, the famous Sonnenschein Mantle de Bray theorem was very influential in uh, thinking about, uh, you know, what micro foundation means. That theorem, as we all know, say that even with strong assumption about individual rationality, it is not possible to show that the system will get to an equilibrium or any Pareto optimal state. So the result uh, is very powerful. It implies that almost any observed pattern of market price and quantity data can be interpreted as being the result of individual utility maximization behavior, and therefore raises the question about the degree on which, to which general equilibrium theory can produce testable predictions about aggregate market variables. Alan recalls uh, uh, that you know, reacting to the implication of that theorem, discussing Werner Hildebrand, who has been uh, his longtime friend and co-author, 
concluded that they had to give up models based on individual optimization and just look at what individuals actually do and build theory based on that, not just review preference. So Werner with others started working on the features of individual demand functions and aggregation properties, a line of research that was also embraced by Anna at some point and evolved also the work of statisticians like uh, Wolf and Hardell. So the discipline el went elsewhere, as we know, or especially macro, and then from that point, uh, Alan started uh, this solitary journal, the journey of a contrarian. Recall in that times, uh, um, and here I'm quoting Alan, he says, uh, it became clear that we had within our scientific uh, quote-unquote models uh, to abandon the concern with how the equilibrium prices are established and how the economy evolves towards equilibrium. And then he says there was almost no consideration of the idea, you know, in that group of people he had ori originally worked with, that the economy might never be in equilibrium in the standard sense. So theorists have concentrated on the properties, in particular the efficiency of equilibrium states. They have insisted on the rigor of the analysis, but much less on the realism of the assumptions. So in the end, the mathematical road that we followed petered out some 40 years ago in pure theory and has only remained in macroeconomic theory. So now, you know, the, in, in the work of Alan, there are lots of uh, very useful ideas and key ideas. Uh, and paradoxically, I would say that some of Alan's ideas have um, eventually made it in mainstream economics, uh, even in finance and even in macro. But you know, somehow they have been transformed, they have been colonized uh, with that kind of typical flexibility of the neoclassical framework uh, to swallow ideas uh, uh, that, uh, you know, and interpret them as, as deviation from optimi optimizing behavior. So paraphrasing uh, uh, what Mascolel uh, talk, you know, call at some point uh, the discipline, we call, you know, the anything goes discipline. And, uh, um, you know, and mm, so I think it's interesting, uh, uh, you know, in looking at Alan's works that, you know, the papers that have been more influential, including in mainstream economic, economics, have been very kind of contrarian papers. And here I would like to cite especially the Ant paper, um, which is one of the papers I like most about Alan's, in Alan's work. And the, the paper offers an explanation of behavior that had puzzled entomologists and also economists. Oh, uh, that, uh, and, you know, you're probably are going to, you know, you all know this paper, so I'm probably it's useless that I recall it. But, uh, you know, here the, the, the idea, I mean, the, the empirical observations was that ants, when they're faced with identical food sources, uh, they are observed to concentrate more on one of these sources. But after a period, actually, they would turn their attention to the other source. And, uh, you know, the same phenomenon has been observed, for example, in how people behave when they choose restaurants, okay? Um, so the paper provides uh, a model, okay, to explain this herd behavior and epidemic that then, you know, and this kind of herd and epidemics have actually became, you know, some, you know, the object of uh, a lot of mainstream work. Um, but uh, uh, actually the importance of that paper is that it explains the herding and epidemics um, in, in financial market possibly, as corresponded to equilibrium distribution of stochastic process rather than a switching between equilibrium. And also uh, the paper provides an example where the behavior of a group as a whole cannot be explained from an analyzing identical individual in, in, um, in, in isolations. So uh, this is an example that if you don't take in consideration the interaction between the individuals, then the group behavior cannot be explained. And therefore, you know, that, you know, you know, basically implicitly uh, is a criticism of the idea that you could uh, micro found macro in the neoclassical sense. Uh, so this theme of aggregation is a very important theme in, in Alan's work and it actually is probably the closer that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, of my work because I started working, started working on the dynamic factor model because I was interested in aggregation in dynamics uh, and, uh, you know, in that sense, I think that, uh, you know, Alan was also influential, though then I, I took a different, a different way, a different path. Um, so, um, in, I think why do I, I like the Ant paper? Because it, 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 uh, it suggests a mechanism. It provides a model that explains that mechanism 
But I mean, it starts from an empirical observation. It explains that actually you can explain her behavior with a mechanism which was, you know, which is different from what, uh, you know, a mainstream economist uh, would have uh, uh, would have suggested. And, uh, you know, OK, so the, this is I think it's, it's important. Another important uh, work, uh, uh, at least uh, it's something that I remember very well because it was developed uh, in the years uh, in which uh, Alan and I were closer, is the work on fish market. Uh, his paper with Vigne is based on, uh, again, on very detailed observations on, uh, on the Marseille fish market. Um, it shows that the fact that aggregate demand for fish is well behaved does not imply isoformis between micro and macro. And, uh, you know, there, there is, you know, the data, are, you know, the, the paper is fascinating because it explains the importance of loyalty uh, by, of buyers and sellers. Uh, the persistence of price dispersion and, um, you know, is, is, is a paper that you probably all know, but again, is the same theme, okay, going from micro to macro and the problem of aggregation. Um, now, many of the ideas in Alan's work have become uh, decades later successful in mainstream economics. Uh, I think uh, the economy has evolved in networks. Networks now, you know, it's very, you know, well published in mainstream journals. Stochastic graphs to model of imperfect communication among individuals and so on. So I think that if somebody came from Mars to Earth today, then that person uh, she would see that economists are worrying about many of the things that Alan has worried in very early stage. Herding, interaction, behavioral economics in general, heterogeneity and aggregation, network. So all things, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, you can say that, you know, Alan was thinking about these things. Well, before, you know, they were kind of uh, sucked in by 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 mainstream economists. Yeah. However, has uh, although, you know, some of these ideas are the object of important empirical work in micro, but also in macro, has sort of given up of providing an alternative, uh, an alternative uh, framework. So I would say that the discipline today is going two different directions. One direction is 100% empirical, in micro especially, using big data set, very granular information on in individuals, almost no theory and almost no econometrics for that matter. And uh, in macro, there is also returns to kind of uh, reduced form models and forecasting use, using machine learning, a big, big, big uh, data set. Um, now, the more the other direction is an obsession with the micro foundations, uh, but micro founding some of the mechanism uh, that uh, you know are no standards that uh, uh, that that we are discussing here. Um, so by using all this ad hoc mechanism uh, in a, an otherwise mi uh, well micro founded uh, uh, model, I think that mainstream economics in a way has become a little bit as in macro now has become very much a black box. Uh, a little bit a black a little bit as a black box as the agent based models that Alana likes and I like a little bit less. Uh, but I would say that today there is much more variety in the at the methodological level than than there was maybe 20 years ago. Although there is an ideological divide that remains about how you should govern market, what you should do, you know, to provide the welfare, so you know, to do public policy. So, and again, I mean, this has been cited, but if I think of the SVB crisis, I wouldn't say that this happened because the economists don't understand contagion. The economists do understand contagion. This happened because there was a regulatory and a supervision, uh, uh, you know, uh, failure. And we can understand what are the political origins of those, of those failures. So I think that uh, uh, this maybe is not a failure of mainstream economics, but is a, fa is a failure of uh, public policy. Now, I want to f finish with the, just one quotation from Alan. So first of all, a quotation of a quotation is a quotation of, of uh, Bourbaki that Alan cited is one of his papers. And I, I think it's good for conclusion. The quotation is from Bourbaki. Uh, why do applications of mathematics ever succeed? Why is a certain amount of logical reasoning occasionally helpful in practical life? Why have some of the most intricate theories in mathematics become an indispensable tool to a modern physicist, to an engineer, and to a manufacturer of atom bombs? Fortunately for us, the mathematician does not feel called upon to answer such questions. Uh, so, the brain 
and the father's general equilibrium, the fathers, they were all men, you know, they were obsessed with mathematical rigor. But if you go today into a top US department, you will see armies of research assistants conducting natural experiments of very specific situations. So, you know, I think that the profession has mostly, you know, backed from that obsessive general equilibrium, you know, rigor of, uh, and, uh, you know, macroeconomy, macroeconomics not even taught in some places. OK, so we have become, I mean, I consider myself a macroeconomist, OK, so I, I, we have become a, a minority. So maybe the direction of travel for economics as a discipline is to go towards measurement without theory. And I'm not sure this is your direction, Alan, but, uh, you know, I'll be happy to hear about the discussion on uh, where do you think we are going? Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucretia, for that wonderful overview. I think you've queued up nicely our third speaker, um, Rob Axtell. Um, and Rob describes Alan Kerman as complexity economist before there was complexity economics. Um, so Rob is, uh, he works at the intersection of computational, social, behavioral and economic sciences. And uh, his research group combines agent-based computing with microdata to build large scale models having uh, real world scenarios. And so, please. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I think that uh, I'll start up by saying uh, there is, uh, we've heard so far about um, what we might call the uh, the early Kerman and maybe now the uh, later Kerman. I, I'm reminded that uh, for those people who do technology change, and I see Professor Dosi uh, and his colleagues over there, uh, when it comes to Schumpeter, there's, it's often discussed that um, there is Schumpeter one who located the nexus of technological change in the corporation. Whereas the Schumpeter two thought the entrepreneur uh, had a had a had a, a key role to play. Those are quite different perspectives. And with with Alan, we maybe we have something similar. We have Kerman one, who is the uh, general equilibrium theorist, uh, and then there's this emerging Kerman two that we just heard about from Professor Reichlin here. So I just would like to discuss that uh, or mention that my first so my first encounter with 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 Alan was not actually in person. It was it was actually as a graduate student. So I was a a student in the in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, we used, in fact, uh, Hildebrand and Kerman as the main graduate text. Uh, so, uh, in fact, we used it for an entire year, uh, now doing doing microeconomics and game theory. And uh, I have to say, with for my group of graduate student colleagues, after after a full year with the with with that manuscript or with that text, we thought that was enough. We had we had uh, had our fill of, of equilibrium theorizing after after an entire year. So it turns out that. Uh, uh, Immediately after finishing graduate school, I, I personally was got involved with the Santa Fe Institute and complexity ideas and complexity stuff. And so, uh, as we just heard about some the agent based models and uh, these kinds of ideas. And so it turns out that there was an early meeting, which I think maybe some people in the audience attended. Uh, I think Professor Green was there and kind of alternative ways of thinking about the economy from a complexity point of view. And uh, I showed up there with it with my with a colleague. Uh, we had just created a an agent based model where we had you know, we had decentralized uh, trade happening you know, out of equilibrium on networks and with bondly rational agents. We had we had all these kind of complexity themes all operating at once. And uh, who's in the audience uh, beside uh, Nick, who is who's here, but also um, Professor Kerman was there. And this is my first experience meeting Alan. I can't, the me meeting was maybe in Vienna. I, I, maybe I don't remember. And uh, so and, uh, and Professor Dosi was there as well. Uh, so I'm thinking that uh, you know I've, I've, I'm I learned from Alan all the equilibrium stuff, and now he's in the audience. And what is what's he going to say about uh, about about this model that we're going to show, which is which is all kind of anti Hildebrand and Kerman, right? And uh, and all the people in the audience, I just remember there were people in the audience like like Professor Schelling was there, and 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 Sid Winner, and, and you know, some of you may know that Professor Schelling was a little bit crusty, and so as and we actually presented at that time a model of of, of his, we showed his model, you know, kind of. Uh, Running live, and he he had some some things to say about it that were uh, uh, maybe uh, kind of he wasn't sure we had done the right done justice to his model. So at the end of our talk, where we we gave we gave a a live display of agents uh, who were uh, heterogeneous and, and trading out of equilibrium. Uh, at the end of that that demonstration, Professor Kerman raises his hand, and and, he, and I'm prepared for him to uh, you know to uh, to be uh, how do I say it kind of maybe in, inhospitable uh, given given that his uh, his book on with with the Hildebrand on equilibrium, but instead uh, in in true uh, uh, Alan style true Kerman style, he said, uh, Mr. Axtell, I think that everything you've shown us has actually been done before 
by my student. And I, 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 I said, well, how is that possible? I, I thought to myself, you know, we, his, his book is all about equilibrium and it's uh, Edgeworth and, uh, you know, Edgeworth Bart, Edgeworth, Edgeworth Box. But sure enough, he, he would later point me to, uh, to his student um, who was at uh, Johns Hopkins, where Alan was first and assistant professor named Alan Feldman, who had done a, who had proved the theorem basically that when in fact uh, you know ar arbitrarily heterogeneous agents change uh, uh, bilaterally, uh, they will in fact reach a Pareto optimum as and uh, as long as uh, it, in the final condition uh, all agents have some of some of of one one good. So this is kind of an arbitrage condition that's met. And this is something that uh, so Alan's student had already sh already shown this. So, so I was I, I was felt quite deflated that you know that uh, I, I had hoped to show Alan something new, and he actually, he had actually already done this uh, sometime before. So, uh, it turns out that my colleague and I decided to write, write an entire book about this 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 uh, simple model called the sugar seed model, but that, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, and so um, we decided to start that book out with uh, a quote from Herbert Simon. Uh, Herbert Herb Simon. Uh, was out was a fan of uh, saying that um, you know, kind of he wanted to always stick it to the natural scientists a little bit. So Herb Simon said that the social sciences are the hard sciences, by which he meant not you know hard and something hardened or difficult, and, but but hard in the you know hard hard in fact being di difficult or hard to do. And uh, I, as as a graduate student, I had gotten used to I had met with Herbert Simon for an hour a week uh, every, for 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 a year. It turns out my, my, my advisor had had fled to MIT, and so. Herb decided to be my de facto advisor, but make a long story short is w once we had decided to, to write, write this book and we're going to open it with a quote from Herbert Simon, uh, we said, well, we're, so we're going to have an entire book about heterogeneous agents who are out of equilibrium, uh, who are uh, interacting on networks uh, with bonded rationality. And uh, so I went to see Simon and I said, we're going to start the book this way. We're going to, this is what we're going to say. Uh, you know, how, do, how should we say it? And um, he sits there and he says, well, you know, of course you have to talk about bonded rationality and, and he, he gave me some sites and then uh, and I said, well, and on the non-equilibrium part, we, we we have this this this, this uh, 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 Kerman Feldman stuff, so that, that that's good. And then he said, Kerman. He said that name's familiar to me. And then so I said, well, we, so we need to have now a citation for for you know who's done the best work on kind of you know on the against the representative agent for the heterogeneous agent. And uh, Simon had this gigantic office, which is totally full of books and pi in a pile high, and, and, you, and it was just journals all over the place. And Simon knew everything about uh, you know, almost everything, and uh, and he he digs down in the stack of books and he he, he pulls out a, a, a you know the the QGE or the JEP I forget which which it was. And he said, well, the same Kerman guy has this article about the uh, about the representative agent here, and you should you should cite him. You should you should start your book out with you know with him too. So. So uh, so so now we have uh, you know we have this we're going to start the book out with uh, with bonded rationality but with Simon but then we're going to go into representative agents with Kerman and then and then again we're going to talk about um, trading out of equilibrium with Feldman Kerman and they said well the final the final pillar is talking about we need to have who's done work on network economics who's this is now the, the early 90s mid, not quite mid 90s who's it's there's an old paper by Fulmer something but uh, not much work and. And, and and it was just amazing to me sitting there. You now the way Simon, Simon would just sit there and think, and he looked at me and he goes, he walks up and he goes to a different stack of papers on his desk, and he has a whole stack of things that look familiar to me. In fact, they're all Santa Fe's two working papers, and he digs through it. And he pulls out this thing, and it's it's a paper by Kerman on trading on networks. Uh, so in fact. Uh, uh, we're going to have these uh, four pillars of our, of our book. I thought it was new. I thought it was novel. In fact, Alan had already done all these things already uh, uh, in, uh, in in the mid '90s, or at least uh, thought thoroughly about them, and uh, was the touchstone for doing uh, the entire program. I think of complexity economics, and uh, is kind of uh, uh, sitting there. We, we don't call it. We didn't call it, Alan didn't call it that at the time, but that's kind of what it's become. And and by or already by the mid '90s, he had he had the vision. To see that we could do heterogeneous interacting agents out of equilibrium with bonded rationality on networks, and that's and that that, that vision has survived. Uh, and then many of the students have done have 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 worked to, to fulfill that vision. Although there's much much work to be done done still, I think. Uh, in preparing for this talk, I did take a look at his at Alan's CV and uh, was very happily sur uh, surprised to see how many students have actually pursued the vision. And uh, and there have been, you know, Alan has supervised more than 40 students, which uh, seems to me to be quite a large number. And just to give some context to it, so it turns out that, as has been mentioned, uh, Alan's advisor uh, was the professor, was the famous professor uh, Akun, 
And so as a mathematician, Kuhn is listed in the uh, mathematical genealogy uh, that's available online, if anyone, anyone has ever looked at that. Uh, and so Alan is listed there as well. So it turns out of the 288,000 mathematicians there with all their students listed, um, what I, my quick calculation is that about one, uh, there's only about uh, 250 people on the, you know, of these well-known mathematicians who have had 40 students, in fact. So this would put Alan in the top uh, tenth of 1% of all of all uh, scholars as an advisor, independent of his particular contributions, simply as an advisor, producing 40 students. But uh, sitting there with this mathematical genealogy, it turns out uh, I did discover something else, and I wonder if, if Alan even knows uh, what I'm going to say next. That uh, you can trace this in this genealogy, you can trace it back, and you can see, you know, who uh, was the advisor of Alan's advisor, and who was that person's advisor, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it turns out, and I just started clicking buttons as one does in kind of uh, you know this uh, online world where it's a hot link, and you can just click your mouse and you, it takes you somewhere, right? So it turns out, if you go back 21 generations in Alan's in Alan's uh, lineage here, so the year is now 1499. Okay. Guess who is in Alan's? Guess who is Alan's great, 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 great grandfather? It's none other than Nicholas Copernicus, <laughs> the astronomer. First, the heretic astronomer, right? So somehow it's fitting, I think, that uh, this, uh, this astro the astronomer who uh, who was so scared of the effect that his work, uh, what it would be uh, on the on, on society, on the church, right, that, that, that he in fact resisted publishing the work until it was too late. Now, I think uh, uh, we're all happy that Alan did not take the similar path and decide not to talk about complexity economics until it was uh, uh, until it was too late. But uh, there's one more thing to say about it, though, and I thought that I just did a little bit of digging on this to, to, to understand it better. It turns out that in Copernicus's time, because his work was published posthum posthumously, uh, some of you may know this, I did not know it well, uh, only a little bit, that he actually was known at, during his life as the money monk. They, well, what about money? And, and Copernicus is an astronomer, right? Is he's a really astrophysicist or something, right? Or of course, he's a monk, but uh, what turns out, and uh, fitting that we're here at the Bank of England, I suppose, that in 1517, uh, Copernicus wrote a book on the quantity of money theory, where he articulates Gresham's law, an early version of Gresham's law. Uh, and just to give a sense of, uh, uh, you know, Gresham was not born until 1519. So in fact, uh, uh, Copernicus had, had first, gets first dibs in this. Now I think that's a, a further uh, history of the thing, but uh, uh, the main thing to say is that Gresham's law is not, is not named after the person who first articulated it, rather it was you know, uh, Copernicus had, had beat him to the punch on it. And so, by the way, some of you will know that um, there's a, it's, an, it's, an old, it's an axiom in the philosophy of science that it's, it's very rarely the first person who describes the idea who it's, who, whom it's named after. It's, a, it's usually the second person. I think this is actually, this is called Stigler's Law. Stigler's Law is that, uh, is that the second person who's, who articulates the idea has it named after them. And, and if you don't believe that, it turns out Stigler was the second person to uh, describe that. Uh, Merton is the original. Okay, but I, I mentioned only because I think that um, uh, it's, uh, it seems fitting to have Copernicus and Allen's uh, in Allen's uh, background, and but 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 that Allen uh, did not, I say happily, did not wait to uh, articulate his vision of a complex economy until uh, in, in a manuscript published after his passing. That we have all the great uh, flowering of Allen's wisdom uh, over the last 20 or 25 years, particularly vis-a-vis -vis complexity. And uh, so with that, uh, I, I just thank Alan for his contributions. Kerman too, complexity economist. You really did your homework on it. Uh, just to close, uh, talk about uh, some of the recent work that Alan has done, and it's been mentioned, but uh, he was really a driving force behind the new approaches to economic challenges work at the OECD. And uh, the objective of that was really to put new economic ideas on the table age <clears throat> with uh, policymakers. The results were somewhat mixed. But um, I was really always very impressed by how reasonable Alan would be and very positive and constructive, often telling people what they didn't want to hear. The problem was many of them stopped listening, but um, he's always been energetic and inspiring uh, for the OECD. And I think the organization is very grateful uh, for that. Um, let me close with, um, I think, one of Alan's favorite quotes. And um, it's one that I think defines much of his journey. 
uh, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man by Shaw. Uh, so thank you very much, Alan. And I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience or comments. Oh, there's uh, just a microphone. Yeah. Um, no one has yet mentioned Alan's work with Professor Kierman on catastrophe theory at the present time. Isn't that quite a relevant contribution? Anyone else? Uh, Alan, do you want to respond? Sure. Do you want to respond? Thank you, Mark. Um, are you thinking of uh, customs unions and all that stuff? Or catastrophes. sorry, catastrophes. Ah, catastrophe theory. Okay, sorry, I'm getting very deaf. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, right, that's an interlude too. Um, it's uh, I was at Warwick, and um, Christopher Zeman was the, running the mathematics department, and Christopher <laughs> was one of the people who pushed very hard for catastrophe theory and then of course we moved on to chaos and then finally we came to sort of complex systems stuff and so that's actually an important part of it but I can't say that I actually made much of a contribution to catastrophe theory. Christopher and I did a lot of things together mainly because I liked Christopher a lot but uh, he also built a wonderful mathematics department at Warwick and I spent a lot of my time there but uh, he only um, things that I can say about that is that I did have one student, Michael Blad, and we had this great mm -hmm. idea that uh, you could think of economies as um, things that where there was a sort of surface on which you moved, but they got knocked off that, which people will all said that, and then uh, it would come back quickly and then move on this surface. And Michael Blad wrote a thesis about that, uh, very good by the way, but so there was this idea already of moving on this surface and then keep coming back to it. But every now and then the surface unfortunately <laughs> gets nasty and you drop off it. And that's the sort of thing that I was very interested in at the time. And Christopher used to go around with a, a machine, which was a sort of uh, disc and it had a rubber band on it and you would move it progressively and nothing much would happen. And suddenly when you got to a critical point, boing, the thing flipped round again. And uh, that was what he called his catastrophe, catastrophe machine. And I remember that he was temporarily um, arrested at um, Heathrow Airport because somebody said, what is this thing? And he said, that's my catastrophe machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you very much indeed. William, uh, Professor Heckman, uh, Professor Axtell, and Professor Reichlin uh, for a wonderful start to the um, conference. Uh, now we move, must move on to the second panel. So thank you all very much indeed. In the second panel, if I can ask uh, Rashana Shanbao, who is the business editor of The Economist newspaper, uh, to come to the front <clears throat> with our two um, discussants, Alan and Professor Joe Stiglitz, uh, to join us at, at, the, at the front. Now, there will be a, a, an opportunity to join this discussion. Um, we need microphones in the room, so uh, uh, if you just patient, we'll, we'll get one of those to you. And if you're watching online and would like to ask a question, then there's a um, <clears throat> there's a Q&A &A box. If you just type that in, then I'll make sure that gets read out. Yeah, up to you. Hi everyone, um, thank you very much Angus. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, with both um, Professors Joe Stiglitz and Alan Cullivan. Um, uh, I'm not going to do very long introductions because um, Alan is the, the man of the moment, the man of the next couple of days. Um, Joe Stiglitz no, needs no introduction um, uh, and the topic of this is how science can improve our understanding of the economy. And, and really, um, this is a discussion between the two of you. So I, I'm surplus to requirements. I've got um, 
uh, a few questions and really want to sort of uh, we'll dive straight straight in. Um, and I wondered if we could sort of just start really with um, what are the, the sort of scientific origins of economics? Um, how has science shaped the discipline? Um, and Alan, maybe if I could start with you, just sort of the, the, the role that science has played in, in shaping economics to this to this point. Is that is that functioning? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Well, um, I think many people here know very well what the uh, sort of link between um, economics and uh, science over time has been, um, starting particularly once economics became, quote, more scientific with physics and basically with classic mechanics. And uh, people like Varas and Pareto all said all the time, you know, these equations that you're writing down are very familiar. They seem to be equations from uh, something that we already know. And classical mechanics became the sort of bedrock of, um, uh, the, of economic theory. And I think that, of course, turns out later to become a real handicap, but uh, because it's very static in its uh, approach and uh, very concerned about equilibrium as the appropriate idea. And I'm, of course, as you know, I came to become very disillusioned with that. But um, in any event, that was, I think, the first part of the scientific path was uh, latching on to mechanics and using that as an example. And you can see in Samuelson's foundations and so forth. But then there was a split between physics and economics, and we chose to go down the, well, let me call it the Bourbaki axiomatic sort of uh, framework and uh, mathematics from that point of view, rather than take off with the statistical mechanics and the statistical physicists and have um, much more randomness in the system. And so we took that road with Gerard de Boer, and Gerard was not sort of um, very, um, let me say, uh, what's the word? <laughs> <laughs> well, char charismatic. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I guess at this thing I'm allowed to recount at least one thing. Tony Atkinson once said that an economist is somebody who didn't have the charisma to become an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I think that's the road we pursued. And uh, first of all, a lot of uh, the discussion from the Enlightenment onwards was if you leave people to their own devices as far as possible, then the system will self-organize itself in a, uh, an optimal, that is by Pareto standards, way. And so this idea of self-organization is absolutely um, essential. And that was the idea of the invisible hand. But curiously enough, as we became more and more concerned with the idea of trying to show that an economy that wasn't in equilibrium would get there, and ran into trouble and finally with a theorem that Lucrezia already mentioned, uh, Sonnenschein, Mantel and de Brue, we showed that in fact with the standard assumptions you could not argue that the economy would get there. Simple solution, well then we'd simply assume we're already at equilibrium. <laughs> That's much easier and then you can study the properties of equilibrium and you don't just have a few annoying people who say, but how did he get there? How does that organization happen? And then you find people like Hayek trying to explain how that happened with a story about tin. You know, there's a shortage of tin. And so this guy's wandering around trying to find more tin. And so he then managed to pay somebody a higher price to get the tin. And then the price moves. And uh, so that, that was Hayek's sort of explanation of how prices move when there's a shortage. But Hayek was absolutely clear and I'm sorry to say this because I really didn't like um, Hayek's philosophy, um, was a, a, the, an inspirational idea that you actually had to talk about how this system self-organized itself and not simply say, we got there and let's have a look at it. So that's where our scientific foundations come from. We've had many other influences. Marshall was very strong on biology and he thought that biology was the appropriate analogy for economics and not physics. And other people were very worried about social and psychological aspects, but nevertheless, underlying it was um, this structure, which this formal structure, which still persists 
And I remember Harold Kuhn, who was my advisor at Princeton, he said, Alan, if you think that the world is made up of people who are busy maximizing their concave or quasi-concave functions on convex sets, and that's how the world works, you'll be very happy in economics. He said, but I think you probably, after a few years, will realize that that doesn't make sense. So <laughs> that's a brief potted history of um, the, the role that science has played. It's played many roles, by the way, and many, many competing people have been there, but I don't have time to talk about all that. <laughs> Yeah, well, let me make use to uh, amplify a, a couple points. I mean, the first is, you know, the father of uh, modern economics. We always talk about uh, Adam Smith, and he was important to realize that he was part of the Enlightenment movement. And what a core part of the Enlightenment movement was the belief uh, in science, but it was also uh, a, a key part of the advances of uh, the Enlightenment were to think about social organization. Um, and it was those two science as a uh, understanding the world around us, but also social science. How do we organize people? And it was really important, you know, the context of the uh, uh, of the loss of the authority of the church, uh, and looking for a new source of understanding, and, and that we could understand the world. So science really grew out, uh, developed at that uh, very critical. Uh, time. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that um, Smith himself never believed in the invisible hand. And um, it's sort of, uh, I mean, I'm sure he'd be uh, rolling over in his grave if he thought that that idea was central to his. It was one of the important ideas. But much of what he wrote, both uh, in the theory of moral sentiments and in uh, The Wealth of Nations, was explaining why the invisible hand didn't work. So he had a, a much richer theory of what was going on, including um, one of the key issues that uh, I think has been one of the flaws in uh, modern economics, we'll probably talk about it tomorrow, which is that prices uh, convey all the relevant information um, that, uh, it was very, you know, and he was aware that there was a world of imperfect information and prices don't convey all the relevant uh, information. And uh, it was really over uh, the next uh, century after um, Smith that uh, uh, as economics developed, and it was 19th century uh, economics, that uh, bought into, you know, try to borrow the ideas of equilibrium physics, 19th century physics, uh, and adopt them. I sometimes think that, um, you know, it would have been so much better for economics if nothing had happened for the previous 200 years uh, after uh, Smith. And economics have been, you know, somehow brought out of the uh, sleep uh, in the current era, where biology is much more the the reigning paradigm in science, and particular evolutionary biology, uh, genetics, um, you know, uh, no one thinks that uh, COVID nineteen obeys an equilibrium uh, theory. Uh, that you know w we can write down where it's going, and there's an equilibrium process. I don't, you know, nobody talks that way. Uh, and it, it, that metaphor is really important because um, macroeconomics has been so uh, destroyed, I think, by both the equilibrium process, uh, but even when they brought in uh, uncertainty, it was stationary stochastic processes not recognizing that the world was, you know, always changing. And just to give you one example to, to uh, bring this up to last weekend, um, which is uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, going uh, down. One of the aspects of the rapid demise of the bank is the change in technology. Um, that the way we regulated banks before, admittedly flawed, but let's pretend that we had it right for that era. 
that was an era where money was relatively sticky d deposits but now uh you go to your computer and you say i want to move a couple billion dollars out of my account into some other account and how much work does that take not a lot how much difference in the interest rate would motivate you if you thought the bank had a 0.01 percent probability that it was going to go bankrupt and you were going to lose all your money obviously you'd rush to your computer and take your money out and that actually is what happened 40 billion dollars in one day was what was recorded but in fact uh, i can tell you uh, that there were many uh, there were other people who went to their computer typed in uh, transferring money out and the computer collapsed now how do we think of that uh, we don't even have i think a legal framework about how we are supposed to deal with the situation where you've ordered the bank to transfer money out and it hasn't obeyed you. So uh, the point is, this is an example. We could not have predicted this 20 years ago. The world has changed, technology has changed, and we need to change our regulatory uh, system. Uh, there are many other aspects, uh, ways in which uh, I think um, the uh, fixation on uh, 19th century models and other models of science have led us a little bit astray, astray in our thinking. And a lot of it is, is reflected in a lot of the work that, that Alan has done. Uh, let, let me just uh, mention uh, a couple of them. Um, one of them is um, in a, uh, in econometrics right now, uh, uh, in the places where they quote do good econometrics, there's a lot of emphasis on causality, and you do good uh, econometric tests all based on causality. You do regressions and all that, and empirical tests. Well, uh, another area of that was just referred to uh, Copernicus um, in astronomy uh, you don't do controlled experiments you don't do RTCs uh, on planets as far as I know um, and uh, so this methodology which has become very dominant say in development economics um, is actually very limited you don't do in fact RTCs in uh, in industrial policy and in many, you know, in macro economic, we'll say, okay, this country will have interest rates go up in this uh, inflation, this one we won't, and we'll see what happens. Uh, you just can't do those uh, trials. And occasionally you get natural experiments, but they're typically very unusual experiments. So you always have the problem of external validity. So uh, in many ways, um, that that limitation you know the, the the focus of economics on one particular on our particular uh what happened in the 19th century i think has had a very negative uh, effect uh, the other example uh if you did a regression uh across space uh black holes don't exist but there's a lot of evidence of uh black holes we believe it not because it, it shows up as a zero coefficient if we did a regression all it takes is a particular experiment that verifies that and the same thing einstein's relativity theory was tested by one critical experiment the belief that we have now of gravitational waves was one big experiment and then others uh, validated it but that these were uh, a very big uh, things um the other uh, example that uh, is highlighted by some of Alan's uh, work, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, is uh, they did, uh, even, it was a limited version of even 19th century physics because they didn't really do statistical mechanics. They didn't really do the aggregation in an interesting way from the micro to the macro. And um, so in, in many ways, I guess the point I want to make is that that uh, economics has taken too narrow a view of uh, 
was too shaped by a particular set of ideas that was prevalent. You know, I can't help one more, um, which was which have affected me a lot um, in my work. Um, it's already been uh, you know a reference uh, made to the assumption of concavity. To read uh, my teacher's work, foundations. Everything was about. Uh, 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 concave production functions, concave uh, utility functions, everybody. Um, that kind of smoothness uh, was counter to what you see in a lot of physical systems. Uh, you know, I, I used to, you know, why are there waves? Um, and I couldn't understand that uh, if, if, if that economist assumptions were, were so dominant. Uh, where are there the kinds of uh, catastrophic events uh, that you see? Um, and uh, if you start thinking about economics, you you realize bankruptcy, learning processes, uh, um, any problem of information introduces a fundamental non-convexity. So that the whole structure of what went on in uh, De Bru uh, and that whole style uh, of work um, was based on a set of assumptions which, once you start thinking about many of the most interesting problems in economics, were precluded by those mathematical uh, assumptions. I should tell one story about De Bru, um, which was, uh, I once gave a seminar uh, at, at, at Berkeley uh, in which uh, I showed if there were epsilon uh, surge costs, uh, the whole artifice that he had constructed collapsed. Um, and uh, so I would, you know, sort of a little proud of this and 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 a little provocative. Uh, and so I, at the end of the seminar, and he hadn't said anything, and uh, you know, I was uh, I was a young Turk and being deliberately a little provocative. I said. Uh, you know, what did you think about this? And he said, I, I can't, I, I, Alan could I, imitate his accent better, but uh, this is not my field. My field is competitive equilibrium with convexity. <laughs> and so he didn't want to, he said, I do not want to cast an opinion about something that is not in my field. <laughs> Can I just add one comment to that? <laughs> Gerard de Boer was extraordinarily cautious as a person. And at <laughs> Hebrew University in Jerusalem once, he gave a talk and he made a big mistake. He said, I would actually like to advance a conjecture. A conjecture. <laughs> and uh, he, he gave the conjecture the only time he advanced a conjecture. <laughs> and one of the young graduate students at the back said, don't bother, I can give you a counterexample. <laughs> He never, after that, tried, tried to conjecture again. So, thank you. You, you. We touched on a lot of ideas there, and we, we jumped ahead a little bit to some of the questions that I want to ask. I'd love to come back to talk about what an economics that is um, guided by biology rather than physics would look like, but let, let's come back to that. One sort of, maybe we could talk first a little bit more about the, the ways in which the framework of economics have been shaped as a result of its scientific foundation. So, you know, especially if we think about the state of macroeconomics in particular, we talked about, you, you touched on equilibrium, the idea of equilibrium. There's the question of micro foundations and whether they help to explain the kind of macro phenomena. What other sort of, what are the, the key kind of flaws, do you think, or the sort of the, the, the drawbacks of economics being based on this 19th century idea of, Physics. How long do we have? A couple of hours? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, a day? It. Two days? A couple uh, minutes. I'd like to go through some sort of, uh, Okay. okay. Uh, but Alan, why don't you um, go in first? Okay, I'll start. But um, I think uh, uh, there was a book by Phil Morofsky, a well-known uh, uh, student of um, history of economic thought. And the book is about the influence of physics on economics. And its title is More Heat Than Light. <laughs> I think that's a not, not such a bad title. And I, I think we have got frozen into that uh, framework. And uh, 
there are a number of specific things which we've picked up on and really hung on to. Um, one particular thing that uh, people have now been arguing much more for the stochastic aspect of the evolution of the economy you know rather than have a sort of machine you have something which is like an organism more and we come back that's like biology of course but uh, the idea is that instead of thinking of if only i could understand how all the little cogs and so forth went together uh, then i would be able to give perfect predictions at the uh, macro level but of course this is it's a, for a long time been saying that that's not the right way to look at things. And uh, Phil Anderson once said, you know, you cannot start from looking at the individual particles. And then even if you understand them perfectly and the, the laws that you attribute to them are correct, as you move up in scale, new relationships appear. And they are not there, ones which you could deduce from looking at the individual particles. You could not start from these individuals and build a model of the universe. And they insist very much on that. And uh, I think that's a, a very important um, observation. And Jean-Philippe Bouchot, uh, a statistical physicist at um, uh, the Ecole Normale in Paris, actually gave his Collège de France lectures exactly on that. Now, uh, based on a talk by uh, Phil Anderson, a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, um, a, a paper that he wrote called More is Different. And as you move up in levels, the, the whole structure and the movements are, are things which you could not deduce from any more than you could by picking up the individual ant, deduce anything about how the anthill forms and all the structure around it. And that's something terribly important. You know, and for human beings too, I, I, that was one of the things that worried me most about when I started economics. I couldn't understand why we spent so much time studying individuals in isolation and not worrying about the fact that they're embedded in, in society and that everything we do is influenced not only by our neighbors, but also by the structure of the institutions that have been built up. And these are different in different places, you know, and the, there's no, no way that we could have an overall theory which would capture all those relationships. But so I think that that's um, those sort of things are, are very important to consider. And uh, the fact that properties at the aggregate level emerge from the system, you know, they don't, they're not there as it were. You can't just put down all the little bits and then watch and then all of a sudden this happens. No, they emerge as the system interacts, as people interact with each other. And look at the recent um, crashes. Um, my favorite one is um, uh, cryptocurrencies. I, I, I love it because it's, um, I mean, it's a, a terribly wasteful thing, I know, but <laughs> I love it. If, because it's such a perfect example of how they translate things like the a bubble on tulips and so forth, and the earlier ones, into the modern world. Well, you can't persuade people that tulips are going to be so extraordinarily valuable nowadays, but you can say to them, look, we've got this wonderful new technology, which you won't be able to understand. Um, and uh, this is a very important technology. It's going to change the way everything works. And if only you invest in this now, wow, that's really going to take off. And Bitcoin, of course, it did take off. But it's, you know, we're back to tulip pubs, uh, as far as I can tell. And uh, I think my favorite quote about that is from Paul Krugman, who said, whenever he talks about blockchains and so forth, that people said, people, uh, all turn around and look at each other and say, he doesn't get it. <laughs> and then he said, I finally realized that there was no it to get. <laughs> so uh, let me let me just say then that uh, um, I should pass the word over to Joe. Because, uh, <laughs> OK, so uh, let me answer in first a little bit more prosaic uh, way, because I agree uh, at the deep level what what Alan has said uh, is absolutely correct. Um, I think uh, uh, what I mean in a more prosaic way is that um, the macro models, as already been commented on, um, are basically an attempt to move from the general equilibrium model, competitive general equilibrium model, into 
where where you have lots of equations describing everybody uh, into a model that has aggregate behavior and uh, so involves some form of aggregation. But to do that, the early work particularly uh, said everybody was going to be the same. Now that's really quite remarkable because it says, uh, you know, direct, if everybody's the same, there are no markets. So macroeconomics for 40 years analyzed and you know what they call the Robinson Crusoe economy. Robinson Crusoe economy was not a society. A society. It, it, it was not a social science. So economics moved out of the social science into some sign of kind of solipsistic existence where you say, how do I solve a particular uh, problem that had nothing to do with uh, the actual uh, economy. Um, it was all done in the hope that somehow looking at that would be a reflection of uh, what was really going on and as if, um, but uh, it I, I think turned out to be a very, very uh, bad effort. Um, partly because, I mean, the, the um, underlying roots, I mean, at least this might, of the competitive equilibrium model were flawed because, for instance, uh, markets are not competitive. Um, there's imperfect information and they're not in equilibrium. And the processes by which you get to equilibrium are not there and, and are certainly not smooth. Um, the problems are actually, uh, I think, both deeper and more trivial. Um, the uh, if you think about macro economic dynamics, for instance, uh, if you go from a world where you have one capital good to one where you have more than one, which is including a putty clay model, vintage models, any of those, the dynamics are totally different from the dynamics of a single capital good model. Uh, so uh, the um, there's uh, some of the work that. I've been doing more recently uh, and uh, considers just one perturbation of the standard competitive equilibrium model. Uh, it's not been a hypothesis that's been fully tested, but I think uh, it has a lot of empirical validity uh, and I feel it more strongly almost every day, which is people have finite lives. Um, <laughs> and uh, if uh, they have overlapping generations with finite lives. The dynamics are totally different, uh, even with rational expectations, which is a crazy assumption. But even if you have rational expectations, they have uh, all kinds of what I call wobbly uh, dynamics. So um, they, you know, even within that limited competitive equilibrium framework, you have to make so many assumptions like one capital good, infinitely live behavior, or they act as if they were infinitely live. And actually there's a lot of evidence that people don't act uh, as if they are uh, infinitely live. Um, um, and then finally, uh, the two things I think I, I, I really think are the core problems. Um, uh, I, I mentioned it, uh, which is equilibrium. Uh, the the whole Keynesian concern was how do we get to equilibrium? What what happens in the short one when we're disturbed? And this main framework, the dyna uh, DSG, whether you know New Keynesian DSG, just mis mis mysteriously assumes that we've gotten get to equilibrium. And now there's a whole new generation of models that are moving in the right direction, except in one thing, they haven't solved that problem. So there are the heterogeneous agent New Keynesian models, the Hank models, uh, which introduce a wonderful level of mathematical complexity. Um, not interesting complexity uh, in the uh, dynamic sense, but uh, uh, you can run computers uh, for days to solve the problem uh, that the individuals are supposed to solve mysteriously in a moment. Uh, and uh, they assume that somehow, um, you know, 
uh, they solved this equilibrium problem. The virtue of the representative agent model was that in principle, you could actually solve what the equilibrium looks like. But in order to solve the Hank models, effectively, you have to know everybody else's preferences and all the technologies. So they totally destroyed the whole virtue of the market economy, which is decentralization. So in order to save market economics, they destroyed it. Uh, and I, I find this uh, a really uh, an amazing uh, advance in macroeconomics. Uh, the final thing uh, I would say is the so-called uh, ambition to provide microeconomic micro, uh, foundations, I think, uh, has been consistently a fraud. Now, maybe that's a too strong of a word to put it, but uh, uh, Giovanni agrees with me. Um, they they uh, take, you know, here we are at the Bank of England. One of the critical issues is the demand for money. Um, well, you can uh, believe you have micro foundations for the demand for money by assuming that money is in the utility function. Well, yeah, that's a big advance. Uh, you assume what you want to prove. And, or you have what people in Lucas and a number of other Chicago people have assumed, you require money, cash in advance constraint. But we know that's not true. You don't require, I, know, I came here on a taxi cab where I just used a credit card. Uh, so you don't need cash in banks. In fact, uh, you, so the, the micro foundations of uh, monetary theory are uh, at best uh, very weak. Or you take the assumption of the big advance in micro foundations of wage and price rigidities. So they go from assuming, saying, oh, the old Keynesian models assume wage rigidities. Now, what do they assume? Uh, you can only change your wages uh, in a staggered contract. 94% of all American workers, 96%, do not have contracts. They, the employer is at free to change the contract anytime he can. So, you know, where does that staggered contract come from? Well, it's a convenient thing, but is it going any, uh, uh, is it any advance from simply assuming that wages are rigid? rigid? A little bit, but not, not really providing micro foundations that are uh, empirically uh, relevant. So I guess uh, the bottom line is, I, I think uh, macro has a lot of work to do. <laughs> so so I've, got, I've got a question then, um, actually two questions, maybe you, you could uh, you both answer both of them at the same time. Um, one is, um, is the upshot of this, as somebody who studied economics within the conventional framework, is the upshot of what, what you're both saying that actually economics is too reliant on maths, step away from the models, think about things differently. So that's one question. And then the other is, there are these flaws in the subject. What's been the constraint on actually, you know, sort of fixing it? Okay. Um, so we, which of those two? Oh, well, we'll, we'll, which are, we'll start with the maths because I'm, I'm curious. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, I, uh, First answer would be Sarah Hart, who is the uh, Grisham Professor um, of Mathematics. And that's the oldest chair in the UK, I think. Um, she has said, you know, mathematics should not be used uh, in the way that it is used, uh, which is to have a framework and then you hang other things on the same framework. She said, no, what you should be doing is wandering around looking for new frameworks. And those frameworks you may find in nature or elsewhere. And once you've found a new framework, then you can start to build and theorize on that. But you shouldn't be constantly hanging your ideas on old frameworks. And what she says is that if you do that, you can prove hundreds of useless theorems about irre irrelevant problems. But uh, she said that, you know, any progress has to be made by thinking, trying really to think of it. A new way. That's exactly the problem with mathematics. There are many wonderful examples of how you could, how mathematical uh, mathematical tools can be useful, and but unfortunately, they typically tend to be useful um, in economics 
to improve in some sense our models and not necessarily to improve our understanding of the economy. Let, let me give you a, a simple example. We pr uh, produced uh, a paper once with um, um, Peter Zondermann on Arrow's famous theorem, Arrow's impossibility theorem, a wonderful theorem about uh, which has been widely cited. But in fact, if you look at it carefully, it's, it actually doesn't tell you very much about how, what happens in a system where people have to vote it and so forth. But nevertheless, it's a beautiful thing. And we found this wonderful mathematical structure for it. And it was uh, based on some theory from Bourbaki. And uh, it was um, called, um, it was all about something called ultra filters, but you don't have to worry about that. But anyway, the point is that if you had these very simple axioms on people's mm -hmm. behavior, then with mathematics, you could actually show that you would have to have a dictator, which is what um, uh, Arrow was trying to avoid. So he had all these axioms, simple axioms about people having transitive preferences. And then you put them together and lo and behold, you have to have a, a dictator and you can show that mathematically. So it's a beautiful uh, structure and it, it gave you the exact reason why uh, Arrow's theorem holds. But I have, I'm allowed to think, tell you a, a two minute story, which is that we presented this paper at, uh, in 1972, I think it was in Barcelona, at the Econometric Society meeting. And in those days, you had to send your papers. You know, there weren't, you couldn't send them by email or anything. You had to send them physically, okay? We arrived, got there, and the local organizer, very embarrassed, said, I'm sorry, the customs has com confiscated your paper. And they said, confiscate our paper? It's a theoretical paper. Why would they want to confiscate that? And they said, well, the chief customs officer wants to see you. So, we went to see, by the way, the paper was called Arrow's Theorem, Many Agents and Invisible Dictators. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and, and this uh, purely mathematical uh, reference. Anyway, we went to see the chief uh, um, uh, customs official who sat there on a long table with a, a very fascist sort of hat and a huge portrait of Franco behind him. And he said, Senor Kierman, which invisible dictator do you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sorry. No, 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 that's all wrong. Um, no, 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 no. This is a purely theoretical paper. And we just try to show by um, the mathematics that um, you don't want one person to make all the decisions for everybody. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, yes. Of course not. No. It's a, 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 anyway, this went on this conversation, and finally at the end, he said, "I think, Senor Kerman, you are in good faith, but he said, if you want to give another paper in Spain, change your terminology." <laughs> we kept talking about agents and things like that. Anyway. So but the point is that there are occasions, I think, where mathematics turns out to be very useful and often even in comparative advantage. At some point, it, it gave you a very clear way to solve a problem that people discussed a lot about. But in general, I would say that uh, we will not be able to produce a general model uh, in economics, which would actually be a way you'll be able to prove things. And I have a quote from um, Frank Halm, I think it is. and. Uh, he says, I think, while there will be work for the computer scientist, he's talking about the future of economics. So this is in 1991. He says, I very much doubt that economists will be able to establish general propositions in any but very special examples. Again, I do not judge. Simulation, especially when based on good data, is a perfectly respectable and probably fruitful activity. And everybody was shocked about that because Frank Hahn was really a theorist. I don't think he even ever went to a market. And Dorothy wouldn't let him probably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the, my, my, my simple point is I think we did become sort of mathematical, e mathematic envious, if you like. And uh, last remark that Christopher Zeman and I organized at uh, Warwick rencontre between mathematicians and other people. And we had a rencontre between mathematicians and economists. And there were three uh, fields medals in the math amongst the mathematicians present. Rene Tom, Steve Smale, and John Milner, I think. And on the other side, there were all these people like Gerard de Beau, Hugo Sonnenschein and company. So the economists start by talking about these things. 
And in the second session, Milner raises his hand very, very gently and he says, um, people, you know, we think that you probably know a lot more about some sorts of mathematics than we do. And uh, we're very interested um, in that. But he said, we came here to learn about what the problems are in economics, that we might be able to help you with our tools explained. We didn't come here to really find out how much you know about mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that, that these things lasted two days. The second day was really chilly, you know. <laughs> So I think that's a subject where we do want to formalize all the time and we're always talking about building models. And I have a letter from uh, Bob Solo somewhere here. He said something about I'm not interested actually in building models of the economy of the economy. He said, you know, if I if I want to know about uh, building, if I want to know about why candy rots teeth, I think is what he said. I don't want to have a general model of the human body for that. And so Bob Solo has a much more <laughs> pragmatic attitude of things that he didn't believe that you should have this general elaborate model which is going to solve everything. We just plug it in and everything will work. So I, I think we became overwedded to mathematics. You had a second question, but you should, I should give it to Joe. <laughs> oh, well, Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about maths and then we talk about how the profession moves forwards and what's sort of uh, I mean, I, I have only a couple uh, remarks to add to what uh, Alan has said. I, I, I think that um, one shouldn't blame mathematics for the quandary that uh, economics is in. I, I, you know, I think it is important to think precisely uh, that uh, you, you need to uh, think most of the criti criticisms for instance, that uh, Alan's work has represented the standard uh, model is uses mathematics. Uh, in, uh, it's really that um, simple models, overly simple models, uh, have uh, dominated uh, too much. And you know, it, it, this is a little bit going towards your second question. Um, the profession has become a little bit uh, 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 narrow in the sense that there's an orthodoxy, particularly in macroeconomics, about what are acceptable models, uh, what is a microeconomic foundation for macroeconomics, um, and uh, hasn't used hasn't thought about uh, deeper problems in, in which mathematics would have helped. I mean, for instance, some of the issues on the, in, in complexity and network um, would require them to use another set of tools. So if I were, were to say part of the problem is that uh, uh, many of them don't have enough, much of the profession doesn't have enough of the relevant mathematics. Um, I think uh, uh, one of my teachers, Paul Samuelson, once said, you know, the problem of uh, in graduate training is that once you leave graduate school, uh, that's it. I mean, you're, you're, uh, it, it was at the time we, there were a lot of work in what was called putty clay. Uh, you are malleable until you go to gra finish graduate school and we shape you and the rest of your life, you're that way. So those who went and learned DSG models become committed to DSG models for the rest of their life. I think one of the striking things about Alan that we've already heard about is he could have gone down that trap of, of being a competitive general equilibrium uh, economist in which he would say like Girard did, uh, that's not my field to talk about <laughs> non-convexity is that not, you know, or or any of these other things, uh, you know, that's a different subject. But uh, Alan was interested in trying to explain phenomena, beginning with the things you want to explain and looking for whatever tools were out there. And uh, you know, looking for mathematics in a in a way, mathematics, uh, but it could be ideas outside of mathematics. You know, looking at w what our journal was saying about why we aren't answering questions that they want to answer that w that we need to answer. 
So um, it seems to me that that uh, the problem has been not with the excessive use of mathematics, but not a wide enough a scope of thinking about uh, uh, the where you get information from, how do you question uh, your your uh, results, uh, and uh, you know the the uh, correspondence between our theories and um, some obvious uh, empirical observations, and, and that's why I highlight it. You don't have to have some people say uh, people like me and Alan uh, are not empirical economists. I think we are empirical economists. We don't do regressions, but uh, we spend uh, a lot of our time uh, in the world, and and that gives us data with and and we read other people's work, and that gives us a lot of of, of uh, uh, empirical information that helps us think about whether the theories have some correspondence to what uh, we see or what other people have seen uh, in the world. Can I add something? Because I, I think we're wedded also to the idea of models. Simply, you know, and uh, you said something about uh, we simplify for our, to make a model. But um, as a Chinese philosopher once said, you know, it, uh, water that is too pure has no fish in it. And uh, that's exactly what happens. You purify and purify until you've got something which actually doesn't tell you much more. But I do want to uh, tell you one story about being wedded to models. Um, Mario Draghi, at one point, for whom I have great admiration, by the way, this is not a criticism of Mario <laughs> Draghi personally. But he, when talking about the euro crisis, he said the euro is like a bumblebee. It's a mystery of nature because it shouldn't fly, but instead it does. He said, so the euro was a bumblebee that flew very well for several years. And now I think people ask, how come? Probably there was something in the atmosphere, in the air that made the bumblebee fly. Now something must have changed in the air. And we know what it is after the financial crisis. The bumblebee would have to graduate to be a real bee. And that's what it's doing. And so you say to yourself, but wait a minute. He says at some point, we bumblebee shouldn't fly. Well, why does he say that? And he says that because, in fact, some serious people in the 30s wrote a, a, a paper and, and, in fact, a book on called Le Vol des Insectes. And in this, an aeronautical engineer proved that uh, a bumblebee couldn't fly. Now, of course, <laughs> You know, do you believe the model or do you believe what you have the evidence of your eyes? So I've always wondered how come Mario Draghi could really have given that speech without having uh, reconciled this with his the fact that he saw bumblebees flying. And my only answer is that I think Mario Draghi must live in an apartment and not have a garden. <laughs> so he may never have seen a bumblebee. But but I mean, the point is exactly what you said. You know, you have empirical evidence sometimes, which is so clear, and yet you have a model which says something else, and you actually want to believe in the model. And I think we're guilty of that. It's obviously not quite as obvious an example as that, but that, I think that happens often. And uh, so I, I think this obsession with the models that we're, we, we, we get, we put them down and we want to bend everything into that model. But just as, uh, um, when uh, the Copernicans took over from Ptolemy, the Ptolemaeans hang on for centuries. You know, it's not true that uh, suddenly everybody realized what was going on. No way. They were busy putting epicycles and other things to try and explain that their original theory was correct. So, yeah, and I've described macroeconomics today as very much like a Ptolemaic yes. exercise. They, the, the models where they have wedges um, and I think there are 15 wedges in some of the better models to explain, you know, to reconcile the the model, the theory with the data. And of course, if you put enough uh, variables in there, uh, you have an unidentified system. But uh, then you say you throw out ordinary statistical testing, and you say, well, match moments. So you, you even change the methodology, the statistical methodology, because the standard methodology doesn't work. And then you never do uh, uh, test of significance. 
are there are there are there lessons from other disciplines and uh, the sciences here in terms of it, sort of how the field of study changes over time? And Alan, you were talking about you know economics being frozen at at one point. Um, are there so should should economists be looking at other disciplines to to sort of learn some lessons? But we talked about biology a bit briefly, and and that has gone through two paradigm changes, if you want to call them that. Um, in in my lifetime, you know, uh, biologists at the in the early stages in 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 my career were people who had sort of birds and animals and things in their offices, and they, it's all a bit dusty. And um, then suddenly we moved into molecular biology, and everybody had white coats and had a big microscope, and they were, and that that was absolutely essential. And what became essential the key approach to um biology but now that and I, i'm quoting here from two people who were head of the biology department at uh, harvard and gave a talk at the institute for advanced study in princeton and they said now we're in the process of a third paradigm change which is towards systems biology and um, where you talk about the you know, the whole of uh, biology as a, as a system and look at the interaction between everything and the interdependence, which is terribly important at the current time when we're worried about the ecological balance and the, uh, the bio bioeconomy and so forth. And um, so I think that uh, uh, biology went through a real upheaval twice in my lifetime. I don't see economics as having gone through a real upheaval like that. I mean. You know, uh, people will say, well, there was a real life, uh, the Lucas revolution, but I think it was somehow not a very convincing revolution. And, uh, and, uh, 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 um, but uh, paradigm changes do happen. I mean, even in very simple ways, you know. And uh, sometimes something which was taken as absolutely given suddenly gets taken away from you. The, the, the famous example is in um, uh, gastric ulcers. Gast gastric ulcers were always believed to be due to excess acidity in the uh, stomach. And so you would cure that by giving people alkaline um, com uh, compounds, which would then reduce the acidity. And that worked. So everybody, that, was, uh, that problem was mastered. And then some, I think he was an Australian, said, yeah, no, no, <laughs> it's bacteria, mate. And so what do you mean it's bacteria? And then it's bacteria that cause um, a gastric ulcers. And of course, what happens is that the bacteria are killed by the uh, medicine you give people to reduce the acidity. So it was an effective cure, but it was for the wrong thing. I mean, they just got they got the mechanism wrong. But in, in terms of keeping people reasonably healthy, it didn't actually matter. But nevertheless, it was a complete change in the process which was going on there. And as it happens, it wasn't particularly important that that was the case, but nevertheless, a complete change in the way you look at things. And but the biologists finally accepted that. But I was glad to see that there was a lot of reticence. A lot of guys said, no, no, we don't believe this bacteria story. And one of the guys actually had to sort of put these bacteria into uh, and, and in, ingest it to pro to show that he was going to develop a gastric ulcer, something which most of us wouldn't do. <laughs> and we certainly, certainly wouldn't be doing that with our money. <laughs> anyway, I, I think a, a big difference between uh, biology, the other scientists, uh, sciences, and you might call the, as you say, the hard sciences and economics, uh, is that uh, there are very strong political consequences of uh, what we uh, believe uh, what we do and so if you um, have a model that uh, you know if you believe that raising interest rates is the cure for inflation regardless of whether it's a supply side shock or demand excess demand uh, that has important political consequences you're throwing people out of unemployment you creating stress in the financial sector but if you really believe you have to keep well, confidence in the bank and the central bank, uh, you're willing to kill the patient uh, in order to uh, uh, keep confidence in the doctor. So uh, the, the, these ideas become very powerful 
And these are big distributive battles. Um, you know, are are we concerned about uh, 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 African American young people who will have a 20% uh, unemployment rate, which is a 20, a little over 20% is what uh, Powell was targeting. That's going to have long-term consequences. He doesn't say that's my ambition, uh, but that's the implication of his policies. Or uh, should he be saying we are? It, it, we ought to be doing something about the side effects of uh, our inflation, of, of our uh, interest rate policy. Anyway, the point I want to make is that whatever p policy has huge distributive consequences, um, and uh, that means uh, uh, it's going to be a uh, subject of, of, of immense political uh, uh, controversy. And uh, that means their vested interest in keeping certain ideas alive. And um, I, I think, you know, so certain ideas are convenient for some groups. And uh, uh, that that I think gives, the, gives them a longer life. Harder to do some of the testing, as I said before, you know, you, you can't do controlled experiments. So that always means also the evidence uh, base is a little bit uh, weaker. Um, but the um, uh, what we've seen is how slow the doctrines are to change. So, for instance, after the 2008 crisis, I think most of us thought the standard DSG models and macro, you know, they would have been uh, in the dustbin of history. They showed remarkable resilience. You know, there were many centers that began looking at other models or other ways of looking at it. So it it did have a maybe a statistically significant effect, but it was remarkable that it was as small as it was. So it, uh, you know, so data did matter. What happened did matter, but not as much uh, as I uh, would have would have liked. You asked in the beginning, you know, other science, sciences, I think, are are more open to revision in their views when the data comes in. Another example of a revision that's been very big um, is uh, a, you know, a big controversy in biology uh, uh, was Lamarckian biology. You know, the fact that you could inherit uh, characteristics and, you know, particularly after the DNA revolution, uh, everybody said, no, that was absurd. They believed it was absurd before, but they became. But then what is discovered is that people who have experienced um, um, uh, environmental damage, their children and their grandchildren, the effects seem to be passed on. And then what's so remarkable is you see an empirical observation. People sort of are, are struggling to try to understand this. And then the advances in the basic biology gives us an explanation of what is going on so that the DNA is unchanged. But what, what's happening at the ends of the, you know, the, what activates various pieces of the DNA are turned on, turned on uh, or turned off. And that can get passed on from uh, one generation to another. So, uh, you know, that was a really interesting example where there was empirical evidence that the theory was wrong. And then we made real uh, advances to try to figure out what was really going on. Thank you. So some lessons from from science there. I've been very greedy with your time. Um, we should open it up to questions um, and comments. We've got about five, six minutes, I think. So do put your hands up. We'll collect a few and then maybe um, Alan and Joe, you can just respond to, to the ones that you would like to do. So uh, the lady at the back. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I always had the impression that some of the methods that economics uh, chose were because of the availability of the mathematicals that at the time or the computational uh, uh, ability at the time. I mean, we chose, I mean, my, it was always my impression that we chose a certain type of mathematics like optimization because it was easier also to frame our problems into these settings. Uh, but I think in the past, 
20 years, perhaps even more, uh, we've come to a technological revolution in our models as well, uh, in which uh, perhaps uh, computational solutions are a lot more uh, uh, um, acceptable now than they, because they weren't that possible before. Do you think that that's so? And if so, do you think that perhaps uh, these no equilibrium models or solutions uh, are going to have a better chance of really uh, uh, making their way into mainstream economics in a lasting way. You were asking, asking before what went wrong with economics. I mean, I think everything. <laughs> in its basics, uh, I mean, in its three pillars, equilibrium, rationality, and uh, <clears throat> call it reduction, it is uh, uh, Phil Anderson the contrary. I mean, uh, um, <clears throat> more is, is the same, uh, not the contrary, more is different, more is the same, and uh, more is isomorphic, to the individual, this, and you cannot relax these pillars. A little bit rationality, you can get uh, some homeopathic deviation, keeping uh, the core model of Olympic rationality and calling uh, behavioral, uh, behavioral economics biases vis-a-vis -vis that model of uh, uh, Olympic rationality, and this is why uh, behavioral economics has become respectable, because it had kept the 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 basic edifice, saying, "Well, I'm uh, biased uh, one meter and a half," uh, but there is no abandonment. Abandonment. Now, <clears throat> these are these three pillars. I think are the crucial. The crucial issue, not uh, mathematics or no mathematics. As we were, uh, in fact, I mean, if you put mathematics, no mathematics, you get it wrong. I mean, uh, you're young enough not to remember, but these two gentlemen, they remember. In uh, uh, in China, you had a debate between Mao Zedong and Tan Xiaoping, with Mao Zedong saying, uh, the rat has I've got to be red, and Tan Xiaoping saying, uh, it doesn't matter whether they're red, it's not good enough if they catch mice. Well, I think we want rats that are competent enough to catch mice, and they're also red, that they know mathematics, and they use the mathematics appropriate to face the, the, the right problems. Now the other, I mean, we don't want to have any divide. In fact, as they were saying, uh, we uh, want another mathematics that fits the <clears throat> little last remark. Uh, you were talking about testing, uh, evidence. Uh, I was reading a book on uh, uh, subnuclear physics and uh, uh, there was a remark saying, uh, uh, we may, was about, about a thing that I don't understand what it is, the oscillation of the neutri of the muonic neutrinos. I don't know what it is. But in any case, the, the, this lady was saying, uh, we made 10 million observations, and we are pretty sure that the phenomenon exists because we found 20 instances out of 10 million showing that there is the, the effect. So there must be. Think of an economist. Over there, and then the gentleman here, and then we'll just go back to you both for some responses and maybe do another round. Thanks. I think my question is related to the previous comment uh, because I was trained as an um, undergrad in economics, but then after stepping out of the mainstream economics, when I was come here in the UK to do uh, a ma uh, master's and a PhD in development studies, I suddenly realized a very vibrant area related to economics, but not confined by the mainstream economics. For example, there is active discussion uh, about economics, especially how the material conditions of life are produced and reproduced through the social process in economic sociology. 
uh, specifically in regards to the social development, social construction markets, and also what does consumption mean to people when they consume? So these are societal process rather than pure economic decisions. And then there's also this discipline of economic anthropology, which originated from studying the so-called primitive societies, but then mainly developing to look at how economic activity could be carried out beyond the market. And there's also obviously area studies where also I come from in the, and I think it's heavily embedded with the local context and also enriched by the economic histories of specific societies. And for example, Professor Hao sitting next to me is a Chinese uh, uh, economic historian, so I think he must have a lot to say about that. And also when it comes to the economic messy realities, we have politicians and I know in China statisticians working for the central government's this bureau office actually played a very important role in designing the macroeconomic policies when they don't have enough top tier economists to make the decisions. And also consulting companies obviously are providing consultancies and projects advice to all economic small actors in the society all the time. So my question is, it seems that a lot of the discussions and the criticisms that we have today has been addressed somehow in one way or another in other disciplines. Uh, but it seems that there is always this huge divide between what the economic discipline is talking about equilibrium models and the, what the other people are quietly doing in the society in economic activities. So uh, that I think that, I guess that's my question. Thanks. Thank you. And one last one. Yeah, I have a very similar question. I would like to follow up on the, on the last thing that you discussed, the role of other sciences. And I was a little surprised um, to hear that you generally focus on the so-called hard sciences. And I think we can learn a lot from the other social sciences. We shouldn't forget that economics essentially is a social science. That seems something that we principally forget as economists. But I think we can learn a lot from political theory, sociology, anthropology, um, psychology, and so on. And just to give you an example, uh, something that Alan also worked on, um, the role of identity. So identity economics. So if you count the papers on identity economics, I, I guess we might end up at 20 papers, probably not more. And this is something that's very important in other social sciences. And I'm wondering if we can make more use of those developments in other social sciences. Don't feel that you have to respond to all of them, but any that you do, some, some may have been comments rather than questions, but any that you would like to respond to, please go ahead. Joe, would you like to go first? It, well, uh, on the first question, um, I think uh, the it is not necessarily the case that better mathematical tools will lead us to better economics. I gave you the example of the Hank models where they've used this computational ability to solve problems that would not have been able to been solved and and actually very very sophisticated mathematics has been involved um but it's resting on a foundation of equilibrium analysis that is even more flawed than the representative agent equilibrium analysis and i think the fundamental problem there is they don't begin from the basic question and some of the very basic you know, issues that were discussed uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago about how does the system reach its equilibrium? What they're doing is they're saying, OK, we have an equilibrium theory with a representative agent. It's being criticized that it, people are not the same. And so let's solve that problem. And so they make it more complicated. Uh, and then they say, oh, we'll introduce credit frictions, uh, all other kinds of things, but they don't address the fundamental problem of the equilibrium. So I think uh, I, so it is not necessarily the case that better mathematic mathematical tools will solve the problem. On the other hand, I think we would not have been able to get as far as we can in areas of complexity analysis, uh, dynamics, uh, getting insights uh, as we've gotten and understanding the limitations of these models had it not been for some of the uh, um, advances in computational uh, ability. Uh, let me answer uh, uh, the three other questions all, all relate to, um, uh, let me make just one observation about that, that behavioral economics uh, this dominant stream in the uh, last century 
was uh, based on the work of Tversky, Kahneman and Tversky, which really focused on cognitive limitations. But uh, it assumed that, uh, but for the cognitive limitations, uh, the, the, the analysis is exactly the same. And uh, there's a little bit of a strand in macroeconomics where people talk about rational inattention. And so again, you're, you're trying to go beyond the standard model, but in a very small way, um, important, but still small. Uh, I think there are uh, uh, broader insights uh, from the other social sciences which actually go more to understanding our, our whole society. So the most important uh, that I've been involved in is the no, uh, in terms of, uh, you might, uh, techn uh, technical terms, preferences are endogenous and they are affected by those around us, uh, by the nature of our society. And yet, and at the same time, our, our beliefs and preferences have the effect in society. So it's, these are, again, complex systems. Standard competitive equilibrium analysis always begins with well-defined preferences. And it's clear that there are changes of preferences going on. Young people are becoming more vegetarian and vegan. They seem just as happy uh, and uh, healthier. Uh, not all of us are making the transition for the benefit of the planet as quickly as the younger people are. Uh, and I envy them that they can do it. But the fact is that those are aspects of endogenous preferences that have a really a big effect on our social, economic, environmental systems. Um, that's just one, but but we all know how, how inventions in technology like like uh, the iPhone are, are changing uh, how people interact with each other, tension spans. Um, the number of theorems seems to be going proved as going down. Um, and, and so there are all kinds of societal consequences of some significance that, that are going on once we realize that things like identity and, and, and uh, uh, preferences are endogenous. And just to make one more point, most of the other social sciences uh, accept the notion that we might have more than one set of preferences that could be triggered by various circumstances. Uh, we could be generous at some times and we could be selfish at other times uh, so that we have a, our, we are more complex than is incorporated by, uh, by the model of the standard economic model that treats us as if we're a unitary uh, agent. And thinking about that opens up, uh, I think, uh, interesting uh, issues, including a lot of the ideas from social choice theory then become a, a, a relevant for the behavior of an individual. Oh, oh. Okay, no, I add a few things. To the first question, um, uh, computational economics, and uh, I think that that is becoming more and more important and many um, uh, organizations and governments and so forth are actually simulating models and running them and uh, forgetting about proving that this will happen or that will happen and so forth. So I think there's been a change, but the uh, person whose name I've forgotten now at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the mathematics professor, once, once said that we used to whenever we were faced with a problem, go off and look for something in our toolkit with which we could use to answer that. Now what we do is construct mathematics, mathematical tools to uh, fit that problem. And so there's a change in attitude that is, there isn't a sort of mathematical superstructure sitting out there, which you sort of pick on, but instead you're actually constructing new ideas and new ways of looking at things. So I think mathematics, itself has changed a lot. You know, when I, when I was young, computer science didn't exist as a discipline. It was um, sort of people in white coats behind a big machine, you know, looking at the printout. And, you know, there were all these jokes about when there was a little mouse running in the back of the computer. The guy says, I can't understand why it keeps asking for cheese. And uh, 
But anyway, so a second thing about um, the whole business of behavioral economics, and I agree with Joe that we tend to go back to the structure we have. And so much of behavioral economics has turned around biases. But biases from what? Why is it that we believe that there is a standard framework? You know, uh, Pareto once said, I think people spend uh, some of their time making non-rational decisions and the rest of their time rationalizing them. <laughs> I think that that's a very important observation. You know, it's, we are not these sort of wonderful machines which are doing this thing perfectly coherently. And uh, as, as uh, I think Joe mentioned, you know, you can have uh, different moods will change what you actually prefer to do or what you want, how you want to be seen by other people and so forth. So uh, then there was a question about other social sciences and uh, I think Sebastian asked for that. Um, <clears throat> economic anthropology. Tony Atkinson once said to me after I gave a talk about the fish market in Marseille, he said, but Alan, that's anthropology, not economics. And I said, well, maybe we can learn something from that. And he said, that's probably right, but I don't think that's economics. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so, but I mean, Tony is a wonderful person who worked and did a huge amount of work. So there's not a criticism in any way of him. But I do think we have that attitude that this is economics and, you know, do something out there. And that's not quite kosher or Catholic, Catholic as they say in French. Um, so being interested in what people are actually doing and how they actually work, I think, is of interest. But we probably can't, however deeply and thoughtfully we look, look at individuals as such, we won't better work out how society is going to function. You know, you, you cannot take the, say, the individual ant and structure the whole of the, uh, and uh, look at the structure of the anthill and say, well, I can explain that just by looking at an ant. And you won't better do that. But I, I found an old letter that I had from Bob Solo in 1988. And I was just thinking about how we got stuck into the various um, sort of frameworks that we absolutely have to um, obey to be respectable as economists. And he, what he said was uh, after I'd written a, a paper, we had a long correspondence about this. He said, I wholeheartedly agree with the idea that economics self-destructs in part because we insist on supposing that everywhere and always individuals maximize purely individualistic preferences subject only to technological, legal and budget constraints. That is exactly your orthog orthogonal uh, orthogonality. And he said it's a transparently false assumption and the brotherhood that's the economics profession, expends vast ingenuity trying to find ways to account for facts within that silly framework. I would urge on you that the phrase blah, blah, blah. Um, and then he says, uh, namely the principle that group behavior must be explained in terms, in terms of the behavior of individuals, roughly speaking. That's what misled me, he said. And he said, there are at least two of us. So I was extremely proud to be <laughs> one of the two with Bob Solo. Well, that's a that's a great place to to end. Um, we ran a little over, but I think it was worth it to hear you read from that letter. Um, thank you so much. It's a privilege to hear thank you speak. Thank you very much indeed, Vashana. Um, can I just remind everybody that um, we start again at eight thirty uh, to nine tomorrow. Uh, we have six sessions. Um, people who saw an early version of the programme might have thought we had drinks this evening, but the train strike scuppered that. So we'll be having them tomorrow instead. Um, and so uh, it's been a wonderful start to uh, this conference. Um, if I can just thank all the speakers, Henrietta, William, Jim Heckman, uh, Bob, uh, Lucrezia, Rashana, uh, Joe Stiglitz, and of course, Alan. Thank you all very much indeed for a wonderful start. We'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.